don't make promises in our lives, right? Uh, you know, I, I, anybody who's married means you had to stand before God and before uh, a pastor and other people, and, and you had to make promises to your to your spouse, right? And uh, and you know, I've done many weddings over the past few years, and uh, it's always great to see the love that people have for one another and the promises they make. And it's hard to keep promises, right? Because you have to follow up your promises with what? With your actions. You have to actually <laughs> live up to your promises. And we don't make promises just in marriages, but really in, in business and in friendships. There's so many times throughout our lives when we make promises to one another and we, we try to keep those promises. And we're really disappointed when people break their promises. I know, uh, you know, people break their promise to me, I get disappointed. But if, if I were to break my promise to somebody else, I would feel bad about that. And I would feel like I failed, right? And so this is the interesting thing about, about the story of Christmas and the story of, of all of Scripture is that God makes promises, right? He made promises to his people. And in particular, he's, we, we want to focus in on the family of Abraham. We know that the story of the Bible is God using and, and working through one particular family, the family of Abraham, that eventually became the whole nation of Israel. You know, not too many of us can look back and say, our you know, ethnic group was started by this guy and, 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 and know the names of his family, right? Like, the Jewish people have such a privilege and an honor to, to know that their forefathers were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they are part of the nation of Israel. But God made promises, right? And the ultimate promise that he made to them, among all of these other promises that we've looked at over the years, is the fact that he promised them an ultimate king, the Messiah, right? And in fact, we want to focus in on the, a promise he made to Abraham and a promise he made to David. And we're going to unpack that and we're going to see how this is so important for us to understand what we're even celebrating at Christmas time. Christmas time is a wonderful time of the year in which we do a lot of fun stuff. You know, Paul, I just I saw you guys. Did you guys literally put a big, huge snowman in front of your house like that? <laughs> if you didn't hear that, they have a 20-foot snowman in front of their uh, inflatable snowman. Like, that's hilarious. That's a great, that, 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 that must give everybody who drives by joy seeing that. That's fun. There's nothing wrong with all of these extra little things that we do at Christmas time. That's fun. And I think, go ahead and do that. But what we're celebrating here at Christmas time is the birth of Jesus and, and understanding what that means and, and what that means for history and for the, the, the whole history of the world, but what it means for us as well, right? And so the first thing we're going to look at is uh, about how God promised to Abraham, I already you know, referred to Abraham, this man that God started the people of Israel through. He promised him many things, but this is one thing that he promised. Look what it says. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, seed obviously refers to children, like having lots of children, right? And so this could be on its surface, right? On a surface level, simply could mean that the children of Abraham, which we understand through Isaac and Jacob are the Jewish people, that God would bless the world through them. And that's true. How many Nobel Peace Prize winners, how, about, how many, uh, you know, so many, so many intelligent people, so many entertainers. Think of any comedian, and they're probably Jewish, right? Like, there's so many Jewish people who have been a blessing to this world. And not only that, they were the ones who preserved the scripture for us and preserved that culture, which most of the world has adopted, at least here in the Western world. And that's wonderful. So we, we thank God for the fact that that God has blessed us through the seed of Abraham. But there's an interesting thing that, that uh, the apostles would do with scripture. Now, the funny thing is, I often actually will teach, if we're going to be talking about how to interpret the Bible or how to read the Bible, I want to talk about how to read the Bible effectively, right? Well, we don't want to read the Bible out of context, right? How many times have I said that? Don't read the Bible out of context. Try to understand it in its original context so you can understand what it originally meant, and that's what it means. I'm not changing my mind about that. I think that's very important.
But there is something called, in Jewish uh, culture, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Any, any ideas, anybody? Maybe it's on the wrong spot. There we go. It's got to be something over there. So, so here's the thing. That's too awkward. <laughs> okay. All right, so here's the thing. In Jewish culture, as they are reading the Bible, and they certainly believe in reading it in its original context as well, but there's something called, and I'll just use this word for the sake, especially for anybody watching who might be familiar, they used what's called midrash. And this is a word that just refers to a certain way of reading the Bible. It's not a, a way of reading the Bible that I would personally recommend to each of us to do, but they are the apostles of Jesus and they did it. And so I think it's okay. And this is, this is what it means to do a midrash. It's really sensitive today. And I'm really getting going here too. And it's like, this is, anyway. They would take a verse from the Hebrew scriptures, because that was the only Bible that they had, right? They would take a verse from the Hebrew scriptures and they would notice a word or two in it and they would be like, hmm, I think there's a deeper meaning here. Or there's a different meaning than what it originally meant. Now, in its original context, this, again, probably meant that Abraham's children, his descendants, would, would be a blessing to the world. But look at the way the Apostle Paul dealt with this verse. It's always interesting to see how the apostles read the Bible. He said, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He's talking about the verse we just looked at. And, he, and then he says, but notice it does not say, and to seeds referring to many, but rather to one. So Paul is noticing that the, the verse says singular seed, which of course can mean more than one. We use the word seed to mean more than one, but he's noting the fact that it was singular to say, well, maybe it means one particular descendant of Abraham. And he, he identifies who that is, Jesus, the Messiah. So Paul is is having, you know, a little fun with the text in order to make a point, I think is maybe a good way to say it. Because he's saying that, hey, yes, God's promises and God's blessing can come through Abraham's seed, but who is the ultimate seed of Abraham, the ultimate descendant of Abraham? Well, it's Jesus, the Messiah. And people from all around the world have been blessed through him, has, have they not? We're all here because of the seed of Abraham who has, God has used to bless us, fulfilling the promise that he made, right? And so that's Abraham. So don't forget that Abraham was promised that his seed, through his seed, all the peoples would be blessed. I don't know. All right. The second person that God made the promise to, and, and he said something very similar, is David. And we, we mentioned David last week. David was the second king of Israel. Remember how we talked about how God, uh, Israel wanted a king just like the other nations, and God was disappointed with that. He was like, I, I don't, you're rejecting me when you do that. And so he gave them Saul. It didn't work out. But then he gave him David, and it worked out a little better. And in fact, David was a person who who really understood repentance and understood forgiveness of sin, and he understood worshiping God. And so God blessed David and said that you are going to be the one, I, you know, in, your line is going to be the line that's going to have uh, the kingdom forever. And one of your sons is going to be the ultimate king. And so that's why he said, I will raise up for you your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. The word that's translated here as descendant is the same word that was translated in the Genesis passage for seed. So it's the same word. I will raise up your seed, your son, your descendant after you, and I will establish his kingdom. And we're told that in 2 Samuel there, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Now, Again, the original context is that this, these verses are probably referring to Solomon. Who was David's son that took over the kingdom? Solomon, right? But as 
just like the apostles, we can look at these verses and we can say, well, yeah, that's true. Solomon was the son of David who took over the kingdom and God blessed him and was a father to him and so on. But doesn't this make more sense if we apply it to the Messiah? Who else better than the Messiah is, is the one who has an everlasting kingdom who is a son to the father, right? We refer to Jesus as the son of God and, and, and God as his father because that's the relationship, right? And so these verses here in 2 Samuel about the seed of David, the descendant of David, are referring, yes, in context to Solomon, but more ultimately to Jesus. And so we have these two promises to the seed of about the seed of Abraham and the seed of David. And so it's absolutely no surprise that when the gospel writer Matthew began his book and he talks about the genealogy, or, the, or as it's translated here, the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, who does he highlight first here at the beginning? A descendant of David and a descendant of Abraham. So he was a, you know, all of the apostles were firmly aware that God had made these promises to Abraham and to David. And so when it came time to talk about the birth of Jesus and the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, they really wanted to emphasize, this is it. This is the seed of Abraham and David that God talked about, right? And this is the context of the Gospels, especially the birth narrative. And we started to look at that last week. We looked at the fact that Israel has had this long history of kings and, and issues with their sovereignty over their land. And they always are going up against foreign nations who want to come and conquer them. And in fact, they were conquered. The Babylonians came and conquered the kingdom of Judah, right? And then eventually they were, you know, and they were taken to exile to, to Babylon. But then they were taken, they were allowed to come back. They rebuilt the temple. They, they were able to establish their religion there. We talked last week about the story of Hanukkah, about how it came to a point where the Jewish people had had enough of their oppressors and they decided to fight back, right? And they actually won this small group of Jewish fighters against this big Greek Seleucid army, right? And they won, and that's where the story of Hanukkah comes from. And then from that, and, and this is the point that we don't usually talk about when we talk about Hanukkah, is the family of Judah Maccabee, the, the, the person who was leading the charge, they didn't go, you know, when they regained sovereignty over their land, they could have done anything they wanted, right? They could have instituted any government, any ruler. So they could have found a son of David, right? And they could have given him the kingdom, whoever that was at the time. But they didn't do that. They took over the king, the role of king. And so it was the family of the Maccabees that took over rule over Judea. And so look at that. You have this opportunity to, to, to do the right thing, and they took the power from themselves. And look, there was probably lots of political reasons why they had to do that. And in fact, over time, the foreign rulers started to oppress them again. And by the time we get to the first century BC, the Romans were in power and they had control over the land of Israel. And they got rid of the, the, the line of kings that came from the family of the Maccabees. And who did they install instead? They installed a king named Herod. So Herod was simply, I don't know, a puppet king in, in a way. He was the Roman approved king. He wasn't a son of David. Herod was in fact part of a family that had converted to Judaism. So he wasn't even Jewish by birth, right? And, 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 and even though Herod did a lot of good things, he, you know, uh, what did he do? How would you put it? He, he started a lot of building projects in Jerusalem and made it a bigger city and, and, and more grand city. But he was not the son of David that was supposed to take over and rule over God's people. And so we then get to the story in Luke chapter 1. And we're talking about uh, the, the birth stories here. And the interesting thing about Luke's version is that he doesn't start with Jesus. He starts with the birth of John the Baptist. John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were very faithful people of God. And when, when Zechariah got the news that he was going to have a son, even though he and his wife were, were old and, and, and barren, he gave this amazing praise to the Lord and he recognized that in John, and in fact what was going to be happening with, with Mary and, and Jesus, obviously, 
that God was beginning to fulfill his promises that he had made. And so this is what one, part of what he said in his prayer to God. He said, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David. So he's, he's saying here, look, it's happening. God is fulfilling his promises just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. So there it is. He has visited and redeemed his people because he has sent a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David. All those hundreds of years without a, without a son of David finally being put to an end and God was beginning to fulfill his promises and he was going to promise and he had promised to bring an ultimate son of David. And where do we find some of these promises? We looked at the promise of the seed of Abraham. We looked at the promise of the seed of David. But there are two other passages that are very, very familiar to us during this time of year that promise a son. And the first one is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I think we recognize this, right? The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. So this is a promise of a son of David that will be born to a virgin and he will be called Emmanuel, which is Hebrew for God is with us. Now, the controversial thing here, though, is in its original context, there's that idea again, in its original context, this is not referring to Jesus. This is actually referring to the time when Ahaz was the king over Judea, and it's a sign given to them so that they would know that God was with them, even though that they were facing a lot of military challenges. And, and the sign was that a virgin would give birth to a son and his name would be Emmanuel. And so was there a son, was there a son born to a virgin at that time? Well, if you understand what the word means, I know we've had discussions about this. Some of us in Bible study have had discussions. What does the word virgin there mean in its original context? Well, let's go back to the previous verse. Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will give birth. Well, the, the word virgin there in the text is just the word in Hebrew that means young woman. And usually in that culture, a young woman was a virgin. So it wasn't very controversial, right? A young woman would have a child and he would be named Emmanuel and that would be a sign given to them as encouragement, right? But remember what I said, the apostles used this style of interpretation where they saw Jesus in, every, in almost every verse in the Hebrew scriptures, right? So they read this verse and Matthew probably read this verse and he had access to the Greek translation and he recognized that when the, when the rabbis translated this text into Greek, they used the Greek word for virgin. And so he's like, wait a second. The story of Jesus is that he was conceived to a virgin. Matthew knew this, right? And so he said, ah, that's the greater fulfillment of this verse. So God promises a son who would be called Emmanuel. And this, this, this birth and this conception would be a sign, a, a positive sign, and, and it would indicate that God was with us. And so Matthew uses this verse here in Isaiah, and he recognizes that, hey, yeah, it, pro it originally had to do with King Ahaz in that time, but it has an even deeper meaning and deeper fulfillment in Jesus. Right? And then Isaiah 9.6 which we looked at earlier during our Advent candle lighting. A child is will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. So he'll be the king. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, this is the interesting thing is because a lot of people use this verse to, sh to prove that Jesus is divine or more than, more than human. But... The, thing, the interesting thing is, in its original context, it's referring, a lot of people say, if you read the commentaries, it's referring to King Hezekiah, who was the son of Ahaz. And so he was certainly not divine, and yet all of these titles were being given to him. So in its original context, this is referring to the king at the time. 
But here's the thing about this text and about what we can do just like the apostles did. We can look at this text and say, yeah, it's referring to Hezekiah, sure. But doesn't this also more appropriately refer to Jesus? Who better than Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace? And in fact, if I were to say that in most churches, everybody would say, amen. He's mighty God, eternal father. Actually, that's not even accurate. He's not the eternal father in traditional theology. So what do these phrases mean? Well, we're going to go through this very quickly. The first phrase we can say, wonderful counselor. It's pretty straightforward. As the king, he would be somebody who would give wise counsel to his subjects and, and to the affairs of the nation, right? But the phrase mighty God in Hebrew does not refer to God Almighty. It's referring to somebody who is representing God, somebody who is a warrior even, like a mighty one. And so a lot of the commentaries will say this is probably referring to how he leads the nation in terms of battle and, and war, right? And then what does it mean that he's the eternal father? Well, you really have to look at the text and look at the Hebrew there because it actually it could be better translated as a father of eternity. Not the fact that he is eternal, but he is the father of eternity. And boy, that really fits Jesus, doesn't it? Because who is the one who gives us access to eternity? Right? It's Jesus himself. And he is the prince of peace because he is the one through whom peace comes. And so I really like the way that the new European version puts it. And we can look at it here. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. His name and the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Divine Warrior, Father of the Eternal Age, Prince of Peace. There's also a, another translation that I don't have on the screen and they say Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Hero, Father of the Coming Age, Prince of Peace. So I just wanted to take the time to show you that these, these famous verses in Isaiah about Emmanuel and the virgin conceiving a son and here in Isaiah 9 talking about the wonderful counselor and so on. These are verses that we have to understand had its original context, but very well can be applied to Jesus as long as you understand what that means. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. We don't mean that literally, but we mean that in terms of that, that through Jesus, God is manifested. That salvation came through Jesus, right? And, and we believe that Jesus is the one upon whom, whose shoulders the government will rest, right? And, 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 and he is the king who will be wise and wonderful counselor and, and will be the mighty one who leads God's people and is the father of, of the eternity, the prince of peace. So we look at these promises given to God's people and we say that they're pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. But unless God actually acted and fulfilled those promises, there would be no way to know that these referred to Jesus, right? God has, we're sort of benefiting from the very fact that we're looking back, right? And same deal with the apostles. They're looking back at the fact that God brought Jesus into this world and they're looking back and applying those verses there. And so that's what I want to end with today. And we're going to lead into next week as we look at the story of the conception of Jesus. We're going to look at two verses here. The both will be on the screen. Firstly, God sent the angel Gabriel to Mary, a young woman living there in the land of Israel. And he said, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. The fulfillment of the promises that God had made to Abraham, to David, through the prophets like Isaiah, are be, was being fulfilled in Mary and in, with Joseph. And so here, here's the, the, the point, is that we don't understand the Christmas story. We don't understand what is being said here unless we get the whole story, Right? This is why last week we took the time to look at the history of the kings of Israel and, 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 the, and how things went and how now it's being fulfilled 
the promises that God made being fulfilled in Jesus. And so he used, he's using Mary in, to, to, to bring about the conception of this son of Jesus. But I think we shouldn't forget about Joseph. Why? Look what it says. Joseph is the son of David. Right? There's no, um, uh, as far as I can tell, I'll have to double check this, uh, certainly by next week. There's no indication in scripture or even in early tradition that Mary was a descendant of David. So the, the person through whom that Jesus received the lineage of being a son of David is Joseph. So to me, he's integral, <laughs> right? We, we, li- we like to think about how the fact that uh, he wasn't necessary because uh, God conceived uh, Jesus in Mary without Joseph, right? That's the whole point of the virgin conception. But I think Joseph is integral. I think he is absolutely necessary because he is the one who is the son of David. And so this is why G- Gabriel tells Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to unpack that next week. We're going to look into that. And I'm going to show you, and I, I hope you can come with an open mind. I think Jesus really is the son of Mary and of Joseph but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. We'll look at that next week. And, and I think that that's important to remember that he is the true, genuine son of David. And he is the one through whom God brings salvation. And I don't know about you, but the way I, when I see God you know, fulfilling his promises like this, I can get pretty overwhelmed. I know we're eager to play this song, so let, let's come on up, guys. I'm overwhelmed with God's work in in history you know god doesn't um force people to do stuff i don't know if you've ever noticed that he he leaves it he he gives a person a choice and so what that means is he has to work within history right he has to guide give his guiding presence through history and work with people and despite that despite the fact that he doesn't force people and that he has to rely on people making choices He does these amazing things in history, and he brings Jesus the Messiah into this world. And I'm overwhelmed by that. I I think as we sing the song, we we can praise God for that.